These are the memoirs of Fanny Hill. I am Fanny Hill, and I shall recall to view those scandalous adventures in my life out of which I emerged at length to the enjoyment of every blessing in the power of fortune to bestow. Truth. Stark, naked truth is the word, and I will not take the pains to bestow even a strip of gauze wrapper on it, but will paint situations as they actually rose to me in nature. My maiden name was Frances Hill. I was born at a small village near Liverpool of parents extremely poor and, I piously believe, extremely honest. I was entering on my 15th year when the worst of ills befell me in the loss of my tender fond parents, who were both carried off by the smallpox within a few days of each other, my father dying first and thereby hastening the death of my mother, so that I was now left an unhappy, friendless orphan. As there was nobody left alive in the village who was concerned about what should become of me, I soon resolved to launch myself into the wide world by repairing to London in order to seek my fortune a phrase which, by the by, has ruined more adventurers of both sexes than ever it made or advanced. It was pretty late in a summer evening when we reached London town in our slow conveyance. As we passed through the great streets that led to our inn, the noise of the coaches, the hurry, the crowds of foot passengers, in short, the new scenery of the shops and houses at once pleased and amazed me. The next morning I dressed myself as clean and as neat as my rustic wardrobe would permit me and ventured out by myself. I soon got to an employment office kept by an elderly woman who sat at a desk with a large book before her in great form and order. I sent my eyes on a course round the room wherein they met full tilt with those of a lady, for such my extreme innocence pronounced her, sitting in a corner of the room dressed in a velvet mantle squab fat, red-faced, and at least fifty. She looked as if she would devour me with her eyes, staring at me from head to foot, without the least regard to the confusion and blushes her eyeing me so fixedly put me into, and which were to her, no doubt, the strongest recommendation and marks of my being fit for her purpose. After a little time in which my person and whole figure had undergone a strict examination, which I had on my part tried to render favourable by primping, drawing up my neck and setting my best looks. She advanced and spoke to me with the greatest demureness. She acquainted me that she was actually come to the office to look out for a servant, that she believed I might do with a little of her instructions, that she could take my very looks for a sufficient reference. I therefore gladly jumped at the first offer of a shelter, especially from so grave and matron-like a lady, for such my flattering fancy assured me this new mistress of mine was. I afterwards came to know this was a market where Mrs. Brown, my mistress, frequently attended, on the watch for any fresh goods that might be offered there, for the use of her customers and her own profit. Madam was so well pleased with her bargain that she straightway took me in a coach to her house. I entered her doors with most complete confidence and exultation. You may be sure my good opinion of the place was not lessened by the appearance of a very handsome parlour, which seemed to me magnificently furnished, and altogether persuaded me that I must be got into a very reputable family. It was agreed that I should keep myself upstairs and out of sight for a few days, till such clothes could be procured for me as were fit for the character I was to appear in, of my mistress's companion. But the truth was, Mrs. Brown did not care that I should be seen or talked to by anyone till she had secured a good market for my maidenhead, which I had at least all the appearances of having brought into her ladyship's service. It may not be out of place here to sketch you an unflattered picture of my person. I was tall, yet not too tall for my age, which, as I before remarked, was barely turned of fifteen. My shape? perfectly formed, thin-waisted and light and free, without owing anything to stays. My hair was a glossy auburn and as soft as silk, flowing down my neck in natural waves and setting off the whiteness of a smooth skin. My face was rather ruddy, though its features were delicate and the shape a roundish oval, 
except where a dimple on my chin had far from a disagreeable effect. My eyes were as black as can be imagined, and rather languishing than sparkling, except on certain occasions when I have been told they struck fire fast enough. My teeth were small, even, and white. My bosom was finely raised, and one might there discern rather the promise than the actual growth of the round, firm breasts that in a little time made that promise good. In short, all the points of beauty that are most universally in request, I had, or at least my vanity forbade me to appeal from the decision of our sovereign judges, the men. This is, I own, too strong of self-praise. But would I not be ungrateful to nature were I to suppress, through an affectation of modesty, the mention of such valuable gifts? All the girls that composed Mrs. Brown's flock were sent to visit me, for it was their task to prepare and break such fillies as I was to the mounting block. The frolic and thoughtless gaiety in which those giddy creatures consumed their leisure made me envy a condition of which I saw only the fair side, so much that being one of them became my ambition. One morning I got up about six and stole downstairs with no other thought than of taking a little fresh air in the garden. I opened the parlour door and well surprised was I at seeing, by the side of a fire half out, a young gentleman in the old lady's easy chair with his legs laid upon one another, fast asleep, left there by his thoughtless companions who had drank him down and then went off whilst he stayed behind. On the table still remained the punch bowl and glasses, strewed about in their usual disorder after a drunken revel. But when I drew nearer to view the sleeping one, heavens, what a sight! No, no term of years, no turn of fortune could ever erase the lightning-like impression his form made on me. Yes, dearest object of my earliest passion. I keep forever the remembrance of thy first appearance to my ravished eyes. It calls thee up present, and I see thee now. Picture to yourself a fair stripling, with his head reclined on one of the sides of the chair, his hair in disordered curls, irregularly shading a face on which all the bloom of youth and all the manly graces conspired to fix my eyes and heart. Even the languor and paleness of his face, visible sweetness to the finest features imaginable. Love that made me timid taught me to be tender too. With a trembling hand I took hold of one of his and woke him as gently as possible. He started and looking at first a little wildly said with a voice that sent its harmonious sound to my heart, Pray child, what o'clock is it? I told him and, and added that he might catch cold if he slept longer with his shirt open in the cool of the morning air. On this he thanked me, and eagerly surveying me, sent sprightly fires directly to my heart. Seeing me in a loose undress, he did not doubt but I was one of the misses of the house, yet he addressed me in a manner far from rude, and giving me the first kiss that I ever relished from man in my life asked me if I could favour him with my company. I told him then in a tone set by love itself that for reasons I had not time to explain to him, I could not stay with him and might not even ever see him again with a sigh at these last words which broke from the bottom of my heart. My conqueror, who as he afterwards told me had been struck with my appearance and liked me as much as he could think of liking anyone in my supposed way of life, asked me briskly at once if I would come away with him. Rash, sudden, and even dangerous as this offer might be from a perfect stranger, the prodigious love I was struck with had put a charm into his voice beyond resisting and blinded me to every objection. I could at that instant have died for him. Think if I could resist an invitation to leave that house with him. Thus my heart, beating strong to the proposal, dictated my answer, after scarce a minute's pause, that I would accept of his offer and make my escape with him in what way he pleased. 
It was by one of those miracles reserved to love that we struck the bargain in the instant, which we sealed by an exchange of kisses. After he took his leave, every minute seemed to me a little eternity. How often did I visit the clock, nay, was tempted to advance the tedious hand, as if that would have advanced the time with it. Early the next morning I was in his coach and he by the side of me, with his arms clasped round me and giving me the kiss of welcome. In an instant, for time was now annihilated with me, we landed at an inn in Chelsea where breakfast was prepared for us. An old jolly stager who kept it and understood life perfectly well gave us both a joyous welcome and said he had never seen a handsomer couple. I looked so country, so innocent. My spouse was a lucky man. I pined, I doted, I could have died for him. And yet I know not how or why. I dreaded the point which had been the object of my fiercest wishes. My pulses beat fears amidst a flush of the warmest desires. This struggle of the passions, this conflict betwixt modesty and lovesick longings, made me burst into tears. After breakfast, Charles, the dear familiar name I must take the liberty henceforward to distinguish my Adonis by, with a smile full of meaning, took me gently by the hand and said, Come, my dear, I will show you a room that commands a fine prospect over some gardens. And without waiting for an answer, which relieved me extremely, he led me up into a chamber, airy and lightsome, where all seeing of prospects was out of the question, except that of a bed, which had all the air of having recommended the room to him. Charles slipped the bolt in the door, and running, caught me in his arms, and lifting me from the ground with his lips glued to mine, bore me trembling, panting, dying with soft fears and tender wishes to the bed where his impatience would not suffer him to undress me, more than just unpinning my bodice. My bosom was now bare, and rising in the warmest throbs, presented to his sight and feeling the firm, hard swell of a pair of young breasts, such as may be imagined of a girl not sixteen, fresh out of the country, and never before handled. But even their pride, whiteness, and pleasing resistance to the touch could not bribe his restless hands from roving. But giving them the loose, my petticoats and shift were soon taken up, and the stronger center of attraction laid open to their tender invasion. My fears, however, made me mechanically close my thighs, but the very touch of his hand opened a way for the main attack. In the meantime, I lay fairly exposed to the examination of his eyes and hands, quiet and unresisting, which confirmed him the opinion he proceeded so cavalierly upon that I was no novice in these matters, since he had taken me out of a common bawdy house, nor had I said one thing to prepossess him of my virginity, that darling treasure, that hidden mine, so eagerly sought after by men, and which they never dig for but to destroy. Being now too high wound up to bear a delay, he unbuttoned, and drawing out the engine of love assaults, drove it currently as at a ready-made breach. Then, then for the first time did I feel that awesome weapon battering against the tenderest part. But imagine to yourself his surprise when he found, after several vigorous pushes which hurt me extremely, that he made not the least impression. I tenderly complained that I could not bear it. Indeed, he hurt me. Still, he thought no more than that being so young, the largeness of his machine, for few men could dispute size with him, made all the difficulty, and that possibly I had not been enjoyed by any so advantageously made in that part as himself for still that my virgin flower was yet uncropped, never entered into his head. At length, after repeated fruitless trials, he lay down panting by me, kissed my falling tears, and asked me tenderly what was the meaning of so much complaining, and if I had not borne it better from others than I did from him. I answered with simplicity that he was the first man that ever served me so. 
truth is powerful, and we usually believe what we eagerly wish. Charles smothers me with kisses, begs me in the name of love to have a little patience, and that he will be as tender of hurting me as he would be of himself. He now resumes his attempts in more form. First he puts one of the pillows under me to give the target of his aim a more favorable elevation, and another under my head. Applying then the point of his machine, he seeks entrance, but can scarce assure himself of its being rightly aimed. The door was so small. He looks, he feels, and satisfies himself. Then, driving forward with fury, he is no longer his own master, but borne headlong away by the fury and over-metal of that member, which exerts itself in a kind of native rage. He breaks the union of those parts, now open for life, and carries all before him. Then, then all my resolution deserted me. I fainted away. When I recovered my senses, I found myself abed in the arms of the sweet, relenting conqueror of my virginity, who hung tenderly over me. Charles, to whom I was so infinitely endeared by this complete triumph over my innocence, smothered his exultation and employed himself with so much sweetness so much warmth to soothe, to caress and comfort me that I rejoiced in the pleasure of seeing him, of thinking that I belonged to him, he who was now the absolute disposer of my happiness and, in one word, my fate. He ordered dinner to be brought to the bedside and afterward very impudently asked a leave, the grant of which he might read in my eyes, to come to bed with me. Accordingly, he fell to undressing, which I could not see the progress of without strange emotions of fear and pleasure. He was now in bed with me, and in broad day, and thrusting up his own shirt and my shift, he placed his naked glowing body next to mine. Oh, insupportable delight! Oh, superhuman rapture! curling round him like the tendril of a vine, as if I feared any part of him should be untouched or unpressed by me. I returned his strenuous embraces and kisses with a fervor and gust only known to true love and which mere lust could never rise to. My beauteous youth was now glued to me in all the folds and twists that we could make our bodies meet in. When no longer able to rein in the fierceness of refreshed desires, he gives his steed the head, and gently insinuating his thighs between mine, stopping my mouth with kisses of his charge up the tender folds. Soon his thrusts, more and more furious, cheeks flushed with a deeper scarlet, some dying sighs and an agonizing shudder, announce the approach of that ecstatic pleasure. What floods of bliss! What melting transports, what agonies of delight, too fierce, too mighty for nature to sustain. Thus we spent the whole afternoon till supper time in a continued circle of love delights, kissing, turtle billing, toying, and all the rest of the feast. At length supper was served in, before which Charles had, for I know not what reason, slipped his clothes on, and sitting down by the bedside we made table and tablecloth of the bed and sheets. Thus, making the most of love and life, did we stay in this lodging in Chelsea, which was infinitely endeared to me by the first possession of my Charles and the circumstance of losing there that jewel which can never be twice lost. After about ten days, Charles removed me to a private furnished lodging in D Street, which was more convenient for the frequency of his visits. Here, under the wings of my sovereignly beloved, did I savor the most delicious hours of my life. My Charles I had, and in him everything my fond heart could wish or desire. He carried me to plays, operas, masquerades, and every diversion of the town, all of which pleased me indeed, 
but pleased me infinitely the more for his being with me. He was the universe to me, and all that was not him was nothing to me. <laughs>